Hi, my name's Colin Eberhardt, and I'm going to talk to you today about the software crisis, or what the financial crash can teach us about open source. And apologies for the slightly less than cheery title. By way of introduction, as I mentioned, my name is Colin Eberhardt, and I'm the technology director of a company called Scott Logic. We're a growing UK based software consultancy that works predominantly within the financial services community, and I've been working there for many, many years. And some of the experiences that I've had th from working with our, our financial services, our banking clients are very much reflected in this talk. But also to tell you a little bit about myself, um, this talk is, is very much an intersection of, of my day job and my personal passion. Open source is something that uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved with. I've been working in open source for more than 25 years now. I think my first project, or my first open source project, was one written in PHP about 20 years ago. And before that, I used to write a lot of freeware and shareware software. I also really enjoy data mining and exploring data sets. And as you'll see in this talk, some of these interests are, are certainly coming together here. So back to the topic of the talk itself what the financial crash can teach us about open source. What I want to do is tell you a bit of a story here. For a while, I've been getting a little bit concerned about the overall complexity of our open source software. And it's not just open source software that's getting more complex. Software architectures in general seem to be getting more complex. We're, we're gravitating more towards microservice architectures where, where we take a monolith and we pull it apart into numerous components. Also, Cloud architectures tend to be really quite complex, involving a great many different components. And generally speaking, this is a good thing. However, complex architectures, complex software can be hard to understand. It can be difficult to use safely. Before I use a particular open source project or a library, I often ask myself, who writes this code? Who maintains it? Is this a sustainable project? And ultimately, am I going to regret using it? Is it going to start to fall apart underneath me? And that does happen all too often. So that's the complexity and also the fragility. Complex structures have weaknesses. They fall apart. Uh, security and um, maintenance problems are, are, are prevalent within open source. And finally, sustainability. And I'm not just thinking about the sustainability of my own projects that use open source. I'm thinking about the sustainability of the ecosystem as a whole. How do we create a sustainable open source economy? So I decided to do a bit of a, an exploration myself. Um, I wanted to learn more about this problem and the best way to learn about it is, is to start exploring, exploring the data and exploring the community. So I decided to do a bit of a deep dive and the project that I picked is Express. Uh, and the reason I picked it is because it's a, a project that I've used a number of time, times myself. If you're not familiar with it, Express is basically the de facto web server for Node. If, if, you're trying, if you want to create an HTTP server with Node, you'll almost certainly end up using Express. It's clearly an important project. On GitHub, it has 50,000 stars. It's downloaded 14 million times every single week. It's also 10 years old, so, so quite, a, quite a mature project. So my initial impressions as I started this journey, it's, it's fair to say I was, I was clearly happy at the beginning. I'm, I'm a repeat user of Express, and the reason for that is I'm happy with the functions and the features that it provides for me. So what I wanted to do was start learning how is Express constructed? What are the component parts of Express? So I started to look at its overall composition. I started to look at its dependencies. <clears throat> so Express is composed of 49 separate modules. When you install Express, the, the top level module is installed and this, this is accompanied with effectively a bill of materials and another 13 modules are installed and then further transitive dependencies are installed and, and the, the total composition of Express is 49 separate modules. This is really quite typical and it's not specific to the JavaScript ecosystem. We see similar things happening in Rust, Python and, and other sort of modern software tool chains. So, I was also interested to see how this complexity evolves over time. So I downloaded all of the 163 releases of Express over the past 10 years. And as you can see, 
the complexity of Express in, t in terms of the number of dependencies that it has, the number of modules that, are, that form its total composition is growing over time. If we look back at version two, which was almost 10 years ago, it was composed of four or five modules, version three, more like 10. And then the number of modules grew and grew and grew over time. Interestingly, at version four, clearly there was some sort of consolidation effort. Uh, the number of modules drastically reduced and then it started to increase once again. And this is reflected throughout the open source community. From my personal experience, um, our open source software is becoming more modular. It's, it's, it's more sort of composed of, of disparate parts. So this is clearly the way things work at the moment. But I must admit, I'm starting to feel a little uneasy. If I want to gain an understanding of the maturity or the sustainability of Express, I'm not checking just one project anymore. I'm checking 49. Now, if I want to do something pretty simple, say for example, I need to check that the licenses for each of these modules uh, comply with my own policies. That's relatively straightforward to check. I can, I can automate that. And I must admit, I've used automated license checkers on a number of projects, and it's quite surprising how often you'll find one that, that perhaps doesn't have a license at all or has a particularly problematic license or is public domain. However, license checking is relatively easy. The answer is somewhat binary. It's yes, you can use this. No, you cannot. Measuring quality is, is a lot harder and is, is very challenging. I, I couldn't conceivably uh, check the overall quality of all of these 49 component parts. However, this is effectively the tip of the iceberg. Whilst Express has 49 dependencies, it actually has 195 dependencies in total. The rest form what are known as the development dependencies. These are the ones that you install if you want to work on Express as, a, as the product itself. If you want to alter or change Express, you need to download 195 dependencies. And for other projects I've worked on, this uh, you, you'll find more than a thousand development dependencies. <clears throat> so why should I care? I mean, is, is, is this a problem? Well, in some senses, the tools you use to create a framework or a library like, like Express are are very much reflective of the quality. Uh, you need to pick quality tools to, to create a quality product, and it can be challenging with so many different dependencies. But also, probably a bit more worrying is the scope for what are known as software supply chain attacks. Express being a, an HTTP server is something that, if I were a malicious individual, it would be an interesting uh, project for me to target. Now, I could go after Express directly, or I could go after one of its um, 49 dependencies. So that already gives me a number of different places that I could attack. But something which is becoming more prevalent at the moment is supply chain attacks. So these are attacks that insert themselves earlier into the overall sort of software development life cycle. If I were able to attack and deploy a vulnerability into one of the development dependencies, I could insert a vulnerability or, or, or malicious code into Express at compile time. And this, as I said, is a, is a problem that's occurring more and more frequently. So yeah, this, this complexity is, is starting to make me a little bit nervous. But let's go a little bit further down the rabbit hole. If I install Express, what code is actually being downloaded? And if you install it, do you get the same code? To understand that a little better, uh, we need to understand how these modules are downloaded and resolved. And an important concept here is a thing called semantic versioning. When you first download Express, it comes with effectively a bill of materials. It says, I depend on these other modules. And the way that it declares these dependencies is through a thing called semantic versioning. It's a, it's a concept that was proposed about 10 years by one of the GitHub co-founders. And semantic versioning has a, has a, provides a, a formality to how versions are expressed. Major version increments indicate backwards incompatible changes. Minor version increments um, indicate the presence of new features and, and patch versions are incremented when you fix bugs. So this is a way of having a formality regarding how you version your software. And as our, our, as our, our software composition becomes more and more complicated, uh, concepts like semantic versioning become really quite important. However, I mean, I've got some own 
some of my own personal concerns about semantic versioning, which I shared in a blog post a, a little while back, but that's, that's not for now. However, software products like Express rarely depend on specific or explicit version numbers. Instead, they tend to permit version ranges. So I might declare that I want to use this particular library or tool, uh, but rather than saying I want to depend on version 1.2.3, I'll use this uh, semantic range version, this uh, carry 1.2.3, which is equivalent to 1.2.3 and above, but no higher than 1.3. So what that means is um, the author in this case is explicitly saying, I don't mind if this upstream dependency adds new features. I'm happy to, 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 um, to bring those into my build and I, I'm happy to bring in bug fixes. However, I don't want breaking changes. I don't want major version increments. And this is incredibly common. I must admit, I'm not entirely sure why you would want to permit new features because software being software, a, a new feature in a dependency doesn't magically result in a new feature in your own product. Typically, you have to change your code to accommodate that new feature. However, this uh, use of version, ra version ranges is, is really quite prevalent at the moment. So I did a bit of analysis. Looking at Express, I, I looked at a couple of um, version numbers of Express itself, version 4.16.4, to version 4.17, the next release. Uh, and there was a seven month period between them. And I discovered that there were 33 different configurations of Express itself over this seven month period. So whilst Express had only moved, uh, moved forward one version increment, there were 33 different versions due to the semantic versioning of its dependencies and their dependencies. So basically my, my Express version 4.17 might not necessarily be the same as yours because of the, the sort of slack or, or, or loose nature in this versioning. Yeah, I must admit, I'm getting a bit scared now. So we have complex dependency graphs that are ever changing. Also, another concern is with this ever changing mix of code, who holds the keys? Who is it that is allowed to publish these uh, modules to public repositories that are then downloaded onto my machine, uh, according to this uh, sort of recipe. So again, I did a little bit of digging within Express. And I found that of the 49 dependencies, there were a total of 88 maintainers. So what this means is there are 88 different individuals who can create releases, which will ultimately affect the software that I install when I download Express. Also, you'll see a funny little colouring scheme here, no Bob and includes Bob. Now, what I mean by this is Express has a single core maintainer and rather than, you know, call him out explicitly, I'm just going to call him Bob for the sake of argument. And what this, what this shows is that for a significant number of the dependencies of, of Express, Bob, the maintainer of Express, is also a maintainer. So what this means is Express is, is complicated. It's composed of 49 different modules. However, the maintainer of Express also has an element of control over a number of these dependencies, which is, I'd say, is a good thing. However, <coughs> there are some issues here. Um, there was a, a survey done uh, where the results were published a little while back and only 9% of, of um, NPM maintainers enable two-factor authentication. So what this means is for 91%, all you need is their username and their password, and you can um, create a new release, which is a bit worrying. Uh, also, uh, as a result of this analysis, I have the email addresses of all of these 88 maintainers. And I took the first one and I typed it into um, Troy Hunt's very well known, have I been pwned, which is hacker speak for have I been have I been hacked? Uh, I, I typed it into his well-known website and found that that email address had been subject to, uh, had been uh, found in a great number of different vulnerabilities and um, and data breaches. So, for, so the very first maintainer email I picked, um, I could find that that email address and, and an, an associated password had been leaked as a result of a LinkedIn data breach a couple of years ago. And we all know that most people are not that good at, at uh, creating new and unique passwords. 
and considering that only 9% of these people are potentially using two-factor authentication, it probably wouldn't take me to take too long for me to find a reused password amongst these 88 maintainers. And this is without even looking at the development dependencies, which are, you know, four times as numerous. Yeah, this is getting a bit scary, isn't it? I think we've gone far enough down this specific ra uh, rabbit hole. We've we've learned about the kind of the software bill of materials, uh, the process that, that determines the code we download and, and, and execute is, is really quite complex. And we've looked at this complexity and I guess by virtue of that, there's there's an element of fragility and experience has shown, yes, it is fragile. It, it, it does fall apart. You've probably heard of the, the left pad incident or the, or the event stream incident. I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd look at the most recent incident that I, I can remember. And here's one of them. Uh, there, there's a well-known package called IsPromise. And the author made a tiny little change, an honest change. This wasn't a vulnerability, but there was a small error in that. That change and that error broke a huge number of other packages or modules. It broke Firebase tooling, Angular, AWS, Create React App, possibly many, many more. The impact of this one change was felt uh, widely. Now, in the article that reported this, they made a very good point. The bug didn't crash existing projects, which is a good thing. Just because a new module is released doesn't mean everything will stop working immediately. So there was no actual downtime, but it did prevent developers from compiling new versions of their projects, which is actually a bigger issue than you might expect, because it doesn't just prevent developers from compiling new versions, it also prevents um, continuous integration, so CI, CD pipelines from compiling the project. So what this means is your whole um, software delivery um, uh, sort of life cycle can come crashing down as a result of this tiny little error and this tiny little change. So whilst this article was to a certain extent downplaying the issue, I do think it's, it is a, a significant issue. Coffee time. So, as I said, I think we've gone far enough down this partic particular rabbit hole and it's, it's time to come up from air and look at something else. So, what about funding? Express is a valuable project. It's, it's used by a great many people and a great many others. How is it funded? How are the people that work on it rewarded? Many high profile projects are, are backed by large companies, corporations. TensorFlow, for example, is a Google project. Electron is a GitHub project. React is a Facebook project. There are numerous examples. So what about Express? Nothing. Um, if you look at Express, there's no obvious funding model. And if you look at the, at the commits and the contributions, it's clear that it's pretty much maintained by a single individual. And as, as you know beforehand, I just called them Bob for the sake of argument. I looked deeper into the dependency graph of the, de the uh, runtime, the, the 49 dependencies and the development dependencies. Out of all of those dependencies, I could only find a single project that had any obvious form of funding. And that's a project called ESLint. Now ESLint is, a, is part of the development tool chain of, of Express. It's, it's a tool that helps uh, provide consistent code formatting. Again, it's a very popular and very useful tool. Now, ESLint uses a, a project or website called Open Collective, which is probably the most popular online uh, donation platform for open source. Um, I've used it myself. It's a, it's a, it's a decent website. I, I quite like what they're doing. Um, I, I managed to raise about $50 a month for some of my open source projects, which just about pays my AWS bills. Now, ESLint is the fourth most funded project uh, within Open Collective, so it's it's quite successful. So, does it work? Well, again, I dug into the data. I looked at the 30 um, most funded projects within Open Collective, and for each of them, I turned their annual budget into effectively a full-time employee equivalent. You know, if if I was using that budget to pay my bills and support me or others as a developer, how many people would it buy? And as you can see from the, uh, from the 
graph on the right, the, uh, which is on a log scale, you can see that ESLint, the, the, the funding for ESLint, pays for maybe one and a half full-time equivalents. And ESLint is one of the most well-funded projects on the platform. The most funded project can pay for approximately six full-time equivalents. Now, there are more than 2,000 projects in Open, Open Collective, and there's a long tail who, who have you know, similar experiences to myself. And I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm not attempting personally to use this to, to, to fund my work. It was more as an experiment. However, there are a great many projects on there which really genuinely are trying to use this as a way to fund their work. And unfortunately for the long tail, which is the vast majority of them, they, they, they get little more than enough money to buy the odd cup of coffee. So really this system isn't working when it comes to making a, a sustainable ecosystem. And as a result, people are trying other models. <coughs> some some uh, open source projects collect tips or, or try to use adverts. And again, advertising is something that's been tried and has caused, a, caused quite a stir. However, funding isn't the be all and end all to, to open source sustainability. There's a much more interesting and tricky and challenging side it's the more human side of open source and i'm just going to give one little example again uh, on on express as a project and i've i've again for I, I really don't want to point the finger too much at the maintainer so i've blanked out his name even though i guess it's somewhat futile you could find his name this was an incident uh, where someone raised a security issue uh, against express and there were to cut a long story short there were some pretty big differences of opinion around how it should be resolved. Uh, and there was also a, a certain amount of security theater from, from vendors, uh, that there were some fairly aggressive flags effectively placed uh, and black marks uh, uh, sort of placed against Express. Uh, and there was a, a significant amount of hostility. As a result, the, the maintainer on the screenshot on the right basically publicly said, look, I've, I've had enough. I've, I've I'm sick of the abuse. Um, I'm, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm turning everything off for the weekend. I'm deleting my emails, taking a deep breath, and coming back. This is a, this is a real issue. And yeah, this really is quite worrying. And I honestly didn't expect to find this much that concerned me, and and to a certain extent I, upset me when I, I started the journey. Express really was something I picked out at random. I wasn't expecting to find. Uh, such worrying complexity. I wasn't expecting to find such fragility and, and most worryingly, I wasn't expecting to see um, some evidence of a maintainer really struggling with the project. So I guess the only conclusion I can really come to is that the only reason this all works is because the vast majority of people are good. It, it, it astounds me that this actually works in practice and I think the only reason it does is because most people are are uh, good people. Uh, most people are good actors, but we don't make it easy for them. So this this conference, we're, this is the Open Source Strategy Forum. Um, most of the people listening are, are not not full time open source maintainers. Most most of you are are from banks. So what part do you play? Um, well, before I get onto that, I'll show you the part that we currently play. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live on the border of, of Northumberland, which is a, a beautiful part of the country. We've got lots of fantastic castles there, and this is Annick Castle. Uh, if you've watched Harry Potter, you'll have seen part of Annick Castle. It was, it was used for Hogwarts. Now these structures date back to the sort of medieval times. And in the medieval times, you'd have, have the poor people, the, the, the poor working outside farming the land, and you'd have the rich folk sitting within the castle and the, and the produce from farming the land would be taken into the castle and you'd, you'd keep the riffraff out. And you'd, you'd, you'd try to keep a, a, a clean sanitary environment and, and, and let the riffraff, you know, keep, keep themselves to themselves outside of your castle. And I, I think, I know you might think it's a little bit damning, but to be honest, I think our relationship with open source is quite similar. What we tend to do to tackle these problems is is a process of sort of sanitizing and sterilizing. We, we use security scans, license checking. Once we've cleaned and cleaned and cleaned, 
we then take that code and we place it in our internal repositories where it is now safe. It is again, it's it's kind of the medieval model. The, the, it's the wild west in, in open source. And the best we can do is pluck a code base out, sanitize it, check it to death, and then say, yep, it's safe, we'll, we'll use that. Interesting quote I, I read from, from someone, uh, an open source maintainer who was also struggling. He was at a, an open source software and, and bumped into one of the many kind of security scanning vendors. <laughs> and he realized, so this means that they charge a 50 person startup a whopping $30,000 a year to help them feel safe using the code that open source authors like me have given away for, for free. It's, it's a, a crazy situation. Also, some of these scans are, are, are now pushed out to the wider community. They're not just something that happened within, within the four walls of some sort of big corporation. And Dependabot is something which is uh, turned on by default within GitHub. What Dependabot does is it goes around uh, hunting for people that depend on, on modules that have got known vulnerabilities, and then it helpfully creates a pull request when it spots one of these vulnerable packages potentially being used. And as you can see here, it's, you can see the semantic version range issue going on. It, it, will, it will let you know that you have to bump it from one version to another. However, there are some big issues here. Firstly, I get lots of pull requests from Dependabot every week, but the bigger issue is all that it can ever do is demonstrate the potential for a vulnerability. Now, for a vulnerability to manifest itself, you have to use a particular module in a specific way. If I have a, I don't know, a vulnerability in a templating engine, but I'm only ever using it in my deployment pipeline within a containerized build, that's not the same as if I'm using it on, on, a, on the front end of an application used by my end users. It's completely different. And unfortunately, in my experience of Dependabot, not once has it raised a single genuine security vulnerability. All it's ever done is, to be honest, frustrate me. And again, another quote from that article I briefly mentioned. Um, if it's not fun anymore, you get literally nothing from maintaining a popular package. And this is a growing concern within the open source community. Uh, the day-to-day the, the -day struggles are, are tend, tend to get a bit too much for some people. So what is the solution? I think probably the most important thing to do is gain a better understanding of the problem. And I must admit, I gained a better understanding of the problem through my investigations into Express and writing this talk. Previously, I was of the opinion that funding was the answer. Uh, and I'd explored um, with Finos different ways that we can accelerate funding, but it's, it's not the answer. You have to understand the ecosystem. You have to understand the actors and their motivations. And one thing you also have to understand is that the open source community itself has changed considerably in the past five years. And one of the main reasons why it's changed is GitHub. GitHub has created a centralized community. And actually, if you really want to get into the details of this, I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend this book, which is screenshotted here. It's Working in Public, the Making and Maintaining of Open Source Software by, by Nadia. It's an amazing book and I'd recommend that everyone read it. What she points out, as I said, is that GitHub has created a centralized community. In, in that way, it's, it's much more like YouTube, for example. She also described that the stadium model of, of open source is becoming increasingly prever, uh, prevalent. And what we mean, and to give it, give you a simple explanation there, open source projects are um, more and more often um, the work of an individual. And the stadium model is effectively, you have one individual up on stage and you have tens of thousands who are effectively in the audience. And whilst GitHub uh, makes it easier to contribute, as a result, relationships tend to be more, more sort of uh, transient. You get people ha having kind of fleeting relationships with projects rather than uh, sort of long-term uh, sort of collaboration and association. And probably the most important thing that I learned from this book is that attention is the most prized asset of an open source maintainer. They have a finite amount of time that they can work on the project and they will seek to optimize that time or, or will at least wish to optimize that time 
and gear it towards the things that they fundamentally enjoy doing the most. And I've got a great example of what happens when you don't understand this ecosystem. So every year, uh, DigitalOcean has run a thing called Hacktoberfest. It's a very well-meaning concept. Every year they incentivize people to contribute back to open source and they incentivize them by giving away t-shirts, which sounds, sounds great. I, on the surface of it, it sounds really good. However, this year it fell apart completely. And, and these are, these are concerns that have been building for a long time. And this, this article briefly highlights why. Uh, the author says, so far today on a single repository, myself and fellow maintainers have closed 11 spam pull requests. Each have generated notifications to 485 watchers of the repository. And each requires time to visit the pull request page, evaluate, close, tag it. Effectively, their, their attention is being consumed by this activity in a highly negative fashion. They, they basically call Hacktoberfest a distributed denial of service attack on the open source maintainer community. And I really don't want to be too harsh on DigitalOcean. They were, they were, they were fundamentally motivated by the right things, but clearly they misunderstood the community and how it worked and the whole thing fell apart. So what should we do? Oh, it's, it is challenging. Firstly, don't focus on your own walled garden. And one thing I'll point out here is I, I haven't said don't create your own walled garden. Um, there is still a need to keep your own and maintain your own copies of, of open source code for various different reasons, but don't focus on that entirely. Also, don't focus your time on sanitizing and securing. Again, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it, but don't focus on these two activities exclusively without considering the wider impact on the community. Do learn about and better understand the open source ecosystem. Um, read that book that I suggested. Learn about the maintainers. Learn about the people behind the code that you're consuming. Learn how to effectively contribute. And again, Hacktoberfest is a great example of what happens if you don't contribute effectively. There is a considerable amount of negative contribution going on in open source at the, uh, at the moment. And, and the popularity and the ease of use of GitHub, unfortunately, has increased the noise. And again, GitHub are a, a fantastic, is a fantastic platform and they are trying to tackle this, but it's a real issue. Finally, help the maintainers maximize their attention. And some great ways you can do this is, is not by um, opening up a big pull request with lots and lots of code. You can help them maximize their attention by taking away some of the activities that um, are less desirable to them. You can answer questions on Stack Overflow. You can create examples or help with documentation. You can triage issues. You can fix some of the gnarly bugs that might have occurred. All of these things are significant and valuable contributions that allow maintainers to, to focus on the thing that they want to focus on. A lot of these things are, are better than just, you know, adding a $50 tip every month to some open source collection. Finally, allocate time and budget for this. Um, the, the, the money that you're spending on some of these uh, tools for creating your, your sanitized wall garden, perhaps you should reinvest some of these in actually helping the community directly. And again, allocate time and budget. It could be budget or it could be time. You could just allocate a small fraction of time. If, for example, you're using Express as an example of one of your projects, why not build in something into the backlog? Let's, put, let's spend a little bit of time um, helping fix some of these issues rather than creating our own sanitized version. Thank you for listening. I hope that's been informative and I hope you've learned something from it. Um, I'm going to go back to my day job and, and back to deleting dependabot issues. Thanks very much for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>